Welcome to DivCasts from the University of Chicago Divinity School. For more of our podcasts and information about our terms of use, please see our website, divinity.uchicago.edu slash podcasts. Three points of course. I would like, uh, Linda Doniger unfortunately is ill today, so uh, Jill Braid has graciously um, agreed to chair our session. Jill is the Professor Emerita of the Department of Religious Studies at the University of Missouri and uh, uh, um, from the oh, University yes. of Chicago. Uh, her areas of specialization are the Middle Ages and the Reformation. In her recent project, Religion, the Professions, and the Public, Professor Ray is arguing that to understand any religion, including Christianity, one must know something about the major religions, Asian, indigenous, and other Western religions. She has written on Theodore Beza, The History of Spirituality. Her books include The Conversion of the Elements in Reformed Eucharistic Theology, with special reference to Theodore Beza. Shapers of Religious Tradition in German, Switzerland, and Poland is an edited volume that she put together. Colloquy of Montbelliard is The Religion and Politics of the 16th Century, published by Oxford, and I'm very, very grateful to Jill for doing this for us. Thank you. Thank you, Susan. It's a privilege and an honor albeit a, a sad one because Wendy can't be here. She's uh, ill and we all wish her a speedy recovery. Uh, our first speaker today is Jean-Luc Marion, who is Professor of Religion and Theology in the Divinity School here and also in the Department of Philosophy and the Committee on Social Thought. Professor Marion studies the history of modern philosophy and contemporary phenomenology. He has published several books on Descartes, including Descartes, Metaphysical Prism and Cartesian Questions, Method and Metaphysics. He is also the author of Reduction and Givenness in Excess Studies in the Saturated Phenomena, the Erotic Phenomenon, the Crossing of the Visible, and Prolegomena to Charity, on the Ego and on God, and God without being. Recently, Professor Marion has completed a book on St. Augustine, and today he will speak on the impossibility of the cogito according to St. Augustine. Professor Marion. First, to thank President uh, Freiner and KGP for inviting me to participate in this uh, conference to honor Dick Tracy. Um, I have to say that although I'm to some extent a scholar in your I, uh, uh, I will speak here because I'm too a friend of David Tracy. <laughs> My point today is to explain why there was no such a thing as an ego cogito in Santa Augustine, although everything was ready to build up such an argument. Let us start by the appearance of such a cogito. In the situation of the confession, the cogito finds its own place by becoming <clears throat> what he has to be by answering the call great on him by God. And by <clears throat> knowing God or answering God, according to this thing, immediately the question of the self is asked. And we all know this very famous text from the Soliloquia. Uh, Deum et animam sire cupio. I wish to know God and soul, nothing else, absolutely nothing else. 
That is to say, you cannot uh, you cannot ask to know God without claiming to have access to your own self. And uh, the same text keeps going by saying, Itaque ora brevissime ac perfettissime quantum protest, that is, pray <coughs> uh, as briefly and perfectly as you can, Deus idem est, noverim te, noverim me. God is always the same. I wish I would know me, I wish I would know you. And this concludes, this is my uh, prayer. So, this connection between the question of the self and the question of the God could be compared with the situation of Descartes, where both question of God and question of the, of the self are put together. So, my point is, first, we have to ask whether, from that starting point, Descartes, uh, Augustine could have already uh, enforced the argument of the cogito, that is, is the ego what Descartes called in the discourse of method that truth, steady and <coughs> certain which give access to the rest of philosophy. The comparison of the Cartesian argument with Augustine seemed unavoidable for many witnesses of uh, the work of Descartes in, uh, for instance, as soon as the Discourse of Method was published in 1637, <coughs> Mersenne made the comparison between the argument of the Discourse and a, fa a famous text of the City of God, uh, chapter 11, 26, which uh, uh, <coughs> ask um, don't be afraid of any arguments of the academics <coughs> when they say and what if you are deceived for if you are deceived you are because what is what is not because what is not cannot be deceived and so if you are deceived you are so this uh, comparison was made as soon as the uh, discourse of method and when the, uh, 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 four years after the discourse the meditations were published, Arnaud, which at that moment was not yet a Cartesian, but was well, a very good scholar in Augustine, made the comparison between the argument of meditation 2 and the uh, text of uh, Augustine on uh, uh, the uh, Delibero Arbitrio, which ran the same way. You could not be deceived, would you not first be? It is uh, Delibero Arbitrio 2, 3, 7. And this comparison uh, seemed so uh, appropriate to Arnaud that when, after becoming a Cartesian as well, he discussed again with Descartes in 1648 in a, a letter, he made another comparison, this time with the De Trinitate, book 10, 10, 16, where, uh, uh, again, he, he, he argues that uh, we could compare the, uh, the, the, the cogito, and the cogito as leading to the knowledge of the rest cogitans as a substantia, referring that to Augustine, when Augustine says, and I quote, In, in the... Therefore, when mind knows itself, it knows its substance, and when it is certain of itself, it is certain of its substance. But 
it is certain of itself as everything said above could simply demonstrate. Nor is it in the least certain whether it is air or fire of any kind of body of anything appertaining to, to body. Therefore, it is not any of those things. The whole point of, of its being commanded to know itself comes to this. It should be certain that it is known of the things about which it is uncertain. And it should be certain that it is that alone which alone it is certain that it is. <laughs> and this text uh, is a very good comparison because, because as we shall see, Descartes himself will ask the question whether the what I am can be compared to the air or to the fire or to any other substance, material substance. So there is no doubt that for the majority of Descartes' readers, the comparison between his argument and many texts of, uh, the, of Augustine was obvious. We could even add another uh, more convincing example, although it was not, uh, 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 was not pointed out by Descartes' readers because it refers to a text which was not published in the lifetime of Descartes. I mean, the search for truth, in the search for truth, which was only uh, discovered after the death of Descartes, in the search of truth we have a, a very special uh, formulation of the cogito where uh, Descartes uh, abusiates the cogito to the level, um, or, uh, to, to, uh, to, to, to the level of, of this for, formulation. If I doubt, I am. And this formulation precisely can be found as such in the Detrinitate 10, 10, 14. So there is an additional argument which is not the weakest to make the comparison. So, what should we uh, conclude from this? I would argue that the, nevertheless, also those comparisons can be made and should be made. Uh, the, this, we cannot conclude from that that there is such a thing as a foreshadow of any cogito by Augustine. Why? The first reason is that in fact Augustine is arguing about not the being of the self, but the life of the self. And the most, uh, there are many very clear texts about that. Um, one is De Vita Beata, 2.7. <coughs> And the other is De Trinitate 15, 12, 21. And I shall uh, read a short moment, uh, a short uh, section of that text. Where life plays the role of being in uh, Descartes. The knowledge by which we know that we are alive is most intimately in word and cannot be touched by any academic thing. Perhaps you are dreaming and do not know it, and all you are saying is dreams. Who is unaware that what dreamers see is, see is often extremely like what waking people see? But the man who is certain of his knowledge that he is alive is not saying on, on the strength of I know I am awake, but I know I am alive. It is impossible that this particular point of knowledge should be deceived by dreams, because even sleeping and seeing things in dream is proper to someone who is alive. And some few lines uh, below. So someone who says he knows he knows he is alive, can never be lying or be deceived. Let a thousand kinds of illusion be objected against the man who say, I know I am alive, none of them will worry him, since even the man who suffers from illusion is alive. And we could quote some few other texts where the, the argument about my not being deceived when I say uh, I, is based not, strictly speaking, on the experience of thinking, but on the experience of being alive. 
What is the difference here? The difference is obvious, although very often overlooked. The difference is that it is up to me to experience that I think. It is not up to me to experience that, although it is a thinking experience, I am alive. Because by definition, my life is not mine. My life is not mine. The experience of the self as a living one is that I cannot produce my life as I can produce my thought. It's up to me to, to decide to think or to realize that as long as I want, I can think. I cannot say that about my own life. And it is the definition of the living thing that to live is to get life from elsewhere. And he did my position, the experience of the thinking thing that I can decide and produce my life. And this makes a huge difference in the case of Augustine. Because when I think, in fact, I think that I am alive. I'm not deceived when I experience that I am alive, but it's not up to me to produce that experience. That is to say, the experience of thinking as being alive, insofar as I live, open the experience of uh, self-disappropriation and not self-appropriation. This huge difference, uh, I think Descartes was aware of it, and it is very surprising that also most of his friends and supporting readers <coughs> repeatedly ask him to uh, tell he was an Augustine. Descartes always denied to do so. And we have a very famous letter to Colvius, who was a, a, a Protestant philosopher. This is in December 1640. And <coughs> where Descartes says, <coughs> I, 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 I quote, I'm very uh, thankful to you to give me vindication about that text of Augustine. <coughs> Uh, to which my je pense donc je suis could be related. I went to read it in the library of this city place and I find truly that he used this argument to establish the certitude of our being and then to show that there is some image of Trinity in us as we are in so far that we love and that we want. But on my side, I use the same argument to know that the I who thinks is an immaterial substance which has nothing corporeal, and those two things are quite different. And Descartes would even say <coughs> this again more, more strictly uh, in a letter to uh, Arnaud. And in fact, it is very clear that the main difference is that in the case of the I live, therefore I am, Augustine demonstrates the uh, disappropriation of the self when Descartes, by saying I think, therefore I am, try to establish the self-appropriation of the ego to the point that for Descartes, as uh, it is obvious from that very strange and puzzling and brilliant uh, text from the forward to the French translation of the Principia Philosophy, <coughs> I, will, I quote, I have taken the being of the existence of that thought, mind, as the first principle from which I, <coughs> from which I, uh, uh, I deduce very clearly the following. First, that there is a God. That is to say, in Descartes, the existence of the I is the principle 
from which even the existence of God uh, follows another universe. So the self-appropriation of the self through thought is uh, so strong that he, there is, to some extent, a disappropriation of God. Which is exactly the, the opposite experience to that of Augustine, where the experience I live, therefore I am, is at the same moment as I reach my own existence and experience of the disappropriation of the self. So it's why I shall argue that we should not be uh, more Cartesian than Descartes was, <laughs> we should admit that <coughs> they disagree about the concluding uh, formulation of the argument, although they start with the same premise. And at least two good philosophers uh, <coughs> made three philosophers as pointed out that disagreement between Augustine and Descartes, it was Pascal, uh, there is Blondel also, who said, I quote, don't often quote Blondel at this time at work, okay. Is there any more de uh, deeper conversance than that which would consist in discovering in Augustine a foreshadow of Descartes' arguments? Never Augustine could have thought to uh, take uh, his own thought as the rock on which he could establish the existence of God. And Heidegger says in the uh, Phenomenology des Religieux Lebens, the wine of Augustine's thought had been uh, uh, Dilute in the water of the cardinal water. <coughs> the self certitude and the uh, being in itself, according to Augustine, is something completely different from the Cartesian evidence and clarity of the critic. So this being the thesis, let us try to uh, find arguments to support. The first argument <coughs> is the, ex the paradox of the experience of the critic. For Descartes, the first questions, uh, let us, so my thesis is that there is no experience of the essence of the self in the argument of Augustine. How could we explain that? What is lacking for Augustine, making for it impossible to shift from the existence of the ego to a self-affirmation of the ego? Indeed, cogitatio thought is not lacking. He's speaking about it. Indeed, essay is not lacking as well. What may lack could be the self itself, the ego. And let us uh, give some argument to support the hypothesis of the impossibility to know the ego, that there is no concept, possible concept of the ego in a business. The first point is the paradox that by opposition to Descartes, for whom it's absolutely required to shift from the existing ego to another question, which is what is that self? What is that ego which what I already am? I quote Descartes, Novi me existere, quaero quistim ego ille quam novi. I now know that I exist. I ask now, quistim, who is this 
ego which I am. And to some extent, we have exactly, so this is meditation 2, uh, I don't have any, uh, 7, uh, page 27. And we could compare this to the initial question of book 9 of the Confessions, asking, quis ego et qualis ego? So it's clear that I am now, the question is, quis ego, who am I, and what kind of ego? And what is very surprising, not surprising, <laughs> precisely, is that they exactly the same word, quis ego, qualis ego, in both cases. Quis sim ego ille quam novi, quis ego. If they share the formulation of the question, the opposition could be, I think, served this way. For Descartes, being as thinking leads to two results. The first, my own existence, absolutely certain, first of all. And then, the knowledge of my own essence, that is, at least, if not always, a thinking substance, at least a thinking thing. So, from the same argument, the same experience, the connection, which cannot be uh, 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 disconnected precisely between the exist existing and thinking, there are two conclusions possible. One about the existence, the other about the essence. In the case of Augustine, I suggest it is quite different. Because the connection between thinking, living, and being leads, in fact, to the experience of my unquestionable existence, although the very word of existence is never used. But this experience of my existence opens up the additional experience of the anonymity of the ego. That is, this is precisely because I cannot avoid to make the experience of my existence, which is absolutely certain, that I cannot avoid to be certain that I have no access to any definition of myself. And this experience of being rejected outside of the self precisely by experiencing the existence of the self. That is the situation of the self-anonymity is uh, very much uh, supported by uh, some very famous uh, uh, analysis uh, made by Augustine. Let us very quickly quote some, some of them. All of them can be uh, related by the same conclusion. That conclusion is, uh, uh, it expressed this way, mi magna questio sum. We find this formulation for the first time in Confessiones 449 about the experience of the death of very close friend. This was discussed in the previous sessions. So I don't insist. The fact that when this friend, which was more myself than myself, uh, uh, died, uh, to some extent it is the experience of my Umwelt, that is uh, the, the appropriation of the, of the word around me, which makes the word mine, which is that uh, so the self loses itself. Me magna questio factus sum. There is a, a second example of uh, this formulation, which appears in book 10, in the experience of uh, uh, sexual life. It is in 10, 30, 41. This very well-known exam example, where uh, he says that uh, when I'm awake, I can resist any sexual temptation. But I, when I sleep, my imagination uh, keep going, and I cannot resist uh, uh, sexual temptations, and this uh, giving me the impression that I'm not even myself anymore when I sleep. And he uses any, uh, uh, one more time the same uh, uh, formulation, adding, 
tantum interes inter me itsum et me itsum. There is such a cliff between myself and myself in that case. And um, there is a third example of that formulation, uh, uh, me quaestio factus sum, which is in book 10 again, 10, 30, 3, 50. Um, it is the experience which for Augustine was very uh, uh, disturbing, uh, even for us, it is not that clear why it was disturbing, it is the experience of uh, seeing uh, souls in the church during this liturgical celebration. So, uh, as we all know, uh, the experience of Milan and uh, the, the liturgy uh, called celebra liturgical celebration in the cathedral of Milan was so moving for uh, Augustine that it was part of the preparation to his conversion. And uh, uh, thinking about that, after that, uh, uh, being a bishop, he uh, has to admit that he has the same uh, pleasure. Uh, to sing the songs in the, during the mass. And uh, so then he asked himself, well, what is all this pleasure about? Is it about the meaning of the praise to God or about the pleasure of uh, 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 hearing and, and producing uh, music? And for the, the author of the De Musica, this is not a small question. And it is a disturbing question because it, it shifts a shadow on his own conversion. After all, what was exactly the, the reasons leading him to, to convert? What was that pleasure all about? So you can even suspect your own self at the moment of the conversion for the reason of the conversion. So, those three experiences lead to the third one, which to some extent sums them up all, which is the experience of memory. So I will not insist, I have no time to do that, to do that about the experience of memory, because memory is, uh, let me <laughs> very briefly for you see, a double, uh, as a two, character, two features. The first is that memory is not a faculty among other that could be least within the mind, it is myself. I am my memory. But memory is not the experience of the faculty making things which are not present now, present again. Memory is not about memory. Memory is about forgetting. And the reason is precisely that <coughs> memory, when it makes something alive again, give us at the same moment the absolute certitude that this thing which was completely forgotten and which is now again uh, within my con conscious, consciousness was precisely for forgotten. And when it was forgotten, I had no access in my consciousness to that. So it, is the, it, it gives the evidence that precisely because I can <laughs> get some uh, information back, those information were completely lost. And now, when I have no idea that I could have forgotten other information, it is precisely at that moment that I realized that indeed they are forgotten. So there is a very subtle but very convincing uh, 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 an equation between forgetfulness and memory to the point that memory is the experience of so there was a lot of discussion <coughs> among uh, uh, scholars about the real meaning of uh, memory by Augustine but as you know uh, uh, the core of the discussion was whether after all it was not either in consciousness the unconscious in, as, uh, in the Freudian style, and it was Cyril Lowe has argued for that. Uh, even Gilson said la conscience, and uh, 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 Lyotard suggests l'immémorable. I think we, we could stick to, to the formulation by Levinas, 
and, and, and says that memory for Augustine is about <coughs> the uh, immemorial. The immemorial, that is, the memory of something which was never <coughs> in our consciousness. That is, the memory of what cannot be but forgotten. <coughs> In the case of, of Levinas, it is my uh, 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 indebtedness to the other. It may be, in Augustine, my indebtedness to God. But it may be simply the experience, and we conclude that point with that quotation, uh, what is expressed in Book 10, 8, 15. Great is the strength of memory, too great God, this penetrale amplum et infinitum, this uh, corridor scale, uh, vast and infinite, nec ego ipse capio totum quod quod sum. And I myself, I cannot uh, uh, comprehend completely what I am. I Nec ego ipse capio totum quod sum. This is the anti Cartesian uh, position by excess. I cannot comprehend, I cannot uh, uh, grasp, uh, I myself completely the all of what I am. That is to say, I experience that I am, and it is in that field that I discover it is meaningless and hopeless to imagine that I could reach what I am. The existence gives access to the impossibility of the essence. <coughs> I shall skip some additional uh, 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 arguments borrowed from the uh, question of memoria. But let us uh, see how far uh, we went. What is at stake in the uh, uh, Cartesian argument of the I think therefore I am is not first for Descartes uh, the, the access to the ego. It is through the access to the self-affirmation of the ego what is at stake is the recognition of the first principle of philosophy as such. So, we will be seeing if we have no access to the essence of the self through the existence of the ego. This means not only that we have no uh, achievement of the self as such, but that there is no first principle for any philosophy. And this may uh, <coughs> jeopardize much more the whole endeavor of uh, Augustine. So what about something as a first principle for the rational inquiry of Augustine? How to start with in a discussion with uh, believers or non-believers? Is there any universal, unquestionable principle of rational inquiry that is philosophy? That's the point. It is not only the point of the same. And this will be my last uh, argument. What is fascinating is precisely that Augustine was able to build up such a universal principle of rationality on the basis of the impossibility to have access to the self. Let us see how. The first point that should be uh, emphasized comes from uh, the connection between two formulations in the 
first, the first one in Book 10 of Confessiones, 10, 17, 26, when, <coughs> and 10, 7, 11, when twice Augustine said about the memory, and the memory including the whole experience of the uh, anima. He said, if the memory goes beyond my uh, self-consciousness, beyond my anima, what should I do? I should go beyond my own anima. We have that formulation. 10, 7, 11. What is above the, the head, the top of my anima, of my soul? Through my very soul, I shall go up to you. Transigo vilnea. I shall uh, go through my own uh, strengths. I think I shall extend beyond myself. Same formulation in 10, 17, 26. Transigo et hoc ang via vilnea qua memoria retour. I shall go through uh, my own, this, uh, this, uh, uh, my, this my own strength, which I call memoria. So the experience is not to go back to the mind as the neoplatonism. It is to go through the mind or through the, the soul beyond myself. This self, this experience of self transcending uh, uh, so, uh, self-transcending soul, so to speak, <coughs> and is thinking beyond itself. It's not only a theoretical point of view. It was already achieved in the so-called ecstasis of Ostia in Book 9 of the Confessionist, and I quote, 9, 10, 25, et ipsa anima sidea et transeat se non se cogitando. Uh, may the soul itself keep silence and go beyond itself, transeat, say, non se cogitando, non thinking itself. This is 9, 10, 25. This is such an amazingly precise, non cartesian use of cogitation, which indeed deserves all our attention. The, the, the real experience is to, for the soul, to go through itself and beyond itself, self-transcendence, so to speak. And this is made possible by the idea that the cogitation does not, so does not think itself. It is not thinking oneself that makes this self-transcendence possible. That is to say, there is much more in myself, not only that what I myself can grasp, but much more that I should think. And this experience of the inadequacy by excess of my soul <laughs> upon my soul is precisely what makes the difference between Descartes and obviously on that point. So, question, what does that mean to think beyond what I think, or to think beyond my own thought. What does this mean after? It is indeed the first reaction would, 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 would perhaps to conclude that this is mere nonsense. You cannot think beyond what you think. You cannot think beyond your own mind. I think that to that objection, which cannot be uh, escaped uh, easily, uh, there is a very uh, consistent and rational answer by Augustine. And this answer appears in his doctrine of desire. <coughs> the doctrine of desire is, can be found in an intellectual and spiritual event 
which Augustine again and again uh, emphasized uh, by telling us the same story and which is the story uh, uh, expressed, for example, in the De Trinitate, uh, book 1327, of the first reading of Cicero Treatise, the Hortensius, which is now lost, and we know the Hortensius only because it's quoted here by Augustine. So that story was when he was a, a, a young uh, uh, professor of rhetoric, he uh, went through, uh, by chance, that uh, uh, Hortensius retreat, which is an introduction to philosophy. And this, we guess, quite banal uh, 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 text by Cicero, uh, an eulogy of uh, uh, philosophy as a uh, uh, thought completely devoted to uh, the search for wisdom and things like that, and made on the young Augustine such a, a, a tremendous effect that he has decided him to be a philosopher at any price. He has taken time to, 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 to go there. But it was the, the, the first intellectual and spiritual experience of uh, 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 free use of reason. And what what did Augustine, according to his own report, discover by reading the Hortensius? Let us uh, uh, read uh, De Trinitate 13 to 7. The opening words of the, dis of the, of the uh, discussion was Beati certe honest esse volunt. It is certain that all, all men, want to be happy. The desire for beatitude is what is shared by any human possible being without reservation, without presupposition, without any condition. In any case, you can start the discussion assuming that your interlocutor, as yourself, you all want, at any price, to be happy. And again and again, it is in the De Vita Beata and many other texts, the principle opening the field of discussion, which is not even philosophy because it has no use of the word, nor even theology has no use of the word as well. <laughs> but to open the rational discussion, we can start with the desire to be happy. Omnes, certe, beati, esse, volont. Let us uh, 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 consider this starting point and compare this starting point to the Cartesian starting point. Uh, I think therefore I am. The I think therefore I am is the starting point which can be shared by anyone thinking, and insofar as he thinks. But this starting point has one limitation. He has to be performed. And Descartes insists on that. It is each time and only in so far, how long as I think that the, this first principle uh, 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 can be accepted as such. That is to say, we have to achieve uh, uh, with linguistic performance, so to speak, we have to achieve the principle, that is to own it and to enforce it and to master it in order to use it. So it is not unconditional to that extent that we have to uh, already uh, complete philosophy itself by doing the I think, and therefore we are. On the other side, the principle that omnes beati esse volunt. Does not imply that we are already uh, in possession of that happiness. On the reverse, 
this principle appears to be in any case uh, uh, convincing because it is convincing insofar as we have not yet the possession of beatitude. It is insofar as it is not performed that it is it imposes itself. That is to say, the principle of the desire for happiness is achieved in the formal acception of uh, to be uh, accepted as a ground for discussion insofar as we do not achieve that principle in opposition to the cogito which makes that principle much more encompassing than the cogito because there is no need to some extent even to understand what really it means to my desire to be happy which is unconditional even to the point that I can perfectly well admit to desire what to be happy without knowing whether it is possible, what it does imply, and after all, what it means. The fact that possibly it is impossible to be happy does not disentangle the, 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 the principle. We can as well discuss starting from that principle without any knowledge of what being what being happy means, what whether it's possible and how far it is meaningful. So this principle not only is much more uni it is much universal than the cogito, but it is much more universal because it has no pre condition, no requirement. And it's why we should consider the paradox of this new principle, which is the real principle of rational argumentation for, for, for Augustine. Not only is it unconditional, it is not even based on the requirement of any ontological uh, condition. To some extent, this principle is without being. I mean by without being the fact that, by definition, my need, my desire to be happy is not conditioned by the actual existence of any object of beatitude, <laughs> and not even conditioned by the rationality of that desire, and not even a uh, 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 condition by the fact that we could rationally agree on the definition of the condition of possibility of the fulfillment of such a desire. So, this desire for beatitude being completely unconditional is far beyond the limitation of the usual understanding of philosophy through the limit of being. So, there is a kind of negative foundation, so to speak, not only of the self, which in fact is not based anymore on any essence of what a human being may be, the res cogitans, the substantia cogitans, for instance, but which is based now only on desire, that is, on what is not. It has no need to be to be efficient. But man is now <laughs> really outside of itself. That is the transire anima mea non se cogitando to go beyond my own soul by not thinking myself makes absolutely sense. It is exactly what we do when we accept to define ourselves by our desire to be happy. Because that desire, by definition, goes beyond what we are, beyond my anima, my soul, because it is desire. And it is just because we don't limit our thought 
to ourselves that we can conceive the object of desire, because the object of desire, by definition, has to be far beyond ourselves. Would it be within the limitations, within the field of the self, it would not be the object of desire. It would be, at best, an object of self understanding, self possession, not the object of desire. So it makes absolutely sense to connect the desire, the universal and conditional, and uncontical desire for happiness with the claim to think beyond myself. That is to say, not to adequate my soul to my own self, which to some extent is the exact opposite <coughs> to at least the traditional standard interpretation of Descartes. And that is why there is no such a thing as uh, an Augustinian cogito. Thank you very much. Professor Marion will take several questions if you can recover and find your mind. <laughs> I was uh, interested that you made the move at the crucial point where you wanted to connect going beyond myself to the desire for happiness. I was interested that you made the move there away from Confessions 10 to Nature and Tate, because it seems to me you could have stayed right in Confessions 10 and done that. Because Augustine there says, um, I'm searching for God in my memory, but I do not find him there. But what he does find is the idea of happiness, right? As, as something like an operatory idea, something that all human beings can somehow uh, draw upon that is present within human beings. So I'm, I'm wondering, is there any specific reason why you, why you make the move to Dei Trinitate to establish this point instead of just remaining with an analysis of confessions? Uh, no, it is a methodological reason. That is, uh, your reading of Augustine is <coughs> the more you can connect uh, many texts together, the, 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 the more consistent your reading of Augustine is. So I, <coughs> I think it's... it's uh, an habit, but a bad habit to, st for instance, to, to stick to one text, and for instance, to imagine that the confessionals should be read as an exception to the rest of the world. We have, we have this idea that you have polemical uh, works, uh, serical works, dogmatic works, and on the other side, that more existential thing, which is completely crazy. Indeed, it is the same set of arguments, and so when you can connect them, it's better. For instance, the, the doctrine of memoria, you have to think beyond yourself in book 10, should be connected in the same, same words with the actual experience of uh, Ostia with money. Yes. not even the distinction between uh, mind and, uh, and will or things like that. <coughs> Paradoxically, I think that Descartes, <coughs> so I think indeed there is a strong distinction between the cogito in Descartes, so-called cogito, and Augustine. And all the good philosophers, Blondel, Pascal, and Heidegger, agree that it is not the same argument. It's only average good philosopher who claim that it is the same argument. <laughs> there is a majority of the average good, but I stick to the great one. <coughs> and it is supported by the That's the first thing. 
si comport. Uh, the opposition between Descartes and Augustine is not about one being two more intellectu intellectualists than the other. Because in Descartes, we have also a connection uh, between the ego cogito and the unknowability, both of them, and to some extent of the ego cogito itself. Because in Meditation 3, for instance, there is a deep, uh, uh, a deep uh, emphasis on the fact that the rest cogitans at the end is created to the image of God. And that uh, likeness to God is mainly enforced by will and not by understanding. That is to say, Descartes has kept something of the best of Augustine without, I think, clearly, a clear awareness of the text of, of Augustine. So he's much more Augustinian than many other, than Malbranche, for instance, although Malbranche has always repeatedly and heavily claimed to be the follower of Augustine. To my opinion, he was less follower than, less faithful to Augustine than, than Descartes, who has dismissed that uh, uh, to be personalized by, by Augustine. Um, so that's the, point, the paradox of the thing. But the, the real point is that makes Descartes so uh, close to us is the fact that the first principle in philosophy, so to speak, because he never used first principle as, as his own expression, this first principle for Augustine is not an affirmative one, very strange, it is a negative one, and it is not based on the self identity or self-equality of the self to the self, in both cases through thought, but based on the uh, discrepancy of the self with the self, based on the infinity and anonymity of desire, which is so, is a bit, uh, I should not use those, those not very distinguished words, is so postmodern. It's <laughs> very striking. Is the, 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 the impossibility of self identification, of the self identification of the self, that is the identification of the self to his desire, which is to the other, which makes, which gives us a, 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 a common uh, foundation for rational. Which, after all, uh, happened 
at the end of the discussion about uh, grace, that is with uh, the condemnation of Fédion, I think, roughly speaking, and um, I hope you will uh, not let him uh, agree, this is the closing of the great uh, uh, attempt initiated by Augustine to uh, refresh, to, to connect what is the most universal claim with the most specific Christian theme. And doing that well. I think because of the hour yeah. that we have just moved on, on the other hand, you have to leave. No, no. You can remain. So since Professor Martin can be here, perhaps we can do more questions at the end. We thank you for listening to or viewing our podcast. For more information and for other podcasts, please see our website, divinity.uchicago.edu slash podcasts. Copyright, the University of Chicago Divinity School.